Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Yeah, folks, it is the last Monday of September 2019, September 30th, here we are, episode 41 of the Grim Leftovers program, coming at you live, if you're listening to it live, otherwise coming at you on on recording. (laughs) Anyway, welcome to the show here on reallibertymedia.com, rlmradio.xyz, internet radio, tune in freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org, and a host of other places. Yeah, it's Monday once again, man. It's uh this year's this year's rolled by fast. This is the end of the third quarter. You know, uh it, it's amazing how how this happens. Like week 40. We're in week 40 out of 52. Do the math. I don't know what the math is, but it's week 40 of uh <laughs> 2019. Oh man! Anyway, so uh, I got a bunch of stories lined up for you, as I always do, and uh, I'm gonna share them with you as best I possibly can here on the Grim Leftovers program. Uh, I am Grim there, in case you were wondering who who the hell's yakking at you. Yeah, it's just me. Uh, so sounds like a pre well the intro is well the uh, yeah that is a pre recorded intro. Sock puppet over here in the chat pointing out to me. That it sounded like a pre-recorded intro. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, let me say hi and howdy to the folks over here in the chat that I just mentioned in the chat. Because uh, we got a group group of folks here. We always got a nice group of folks hanging out here in uh, the chat room on uh, Real Liberty Media. It's actually on irc.freenode.net. So come on over to irc.freenode if you uh, know how to do such a thing. If not... You don't really need to know how if you just get on reallibertymedia.com and click the little pop-up chat deal there. It'll it'll connect you right on in. All you got to do is make up a name. It don't, it don't matter what your name is. But, uh, yeah, come on in. Come on in. And you can talk to all the great folks that are over here. The bots and bodies, uh, uh, such as Barman. Yeah, he's one of the bots. We got Beetle and Cowboy Tech, myself, and uh, the Moose Girl. Uh, Mr. Asmo and Chalcedoni. Echelon Traplord is saying, uh, can't get the site to play. Oh, well, um, I can't give you a, I can't give you a link at the moment. Somebody else had to help you out there. I assume, um, <laughs> I don't know why, I don't know why some people can't get that thing to play. It, it plays for everybody. We got Echelon and Graham Z. We got the Java Doctor and Hansel, a.k.a. J. Dreda. The Beastermeister Brow, also known as Woodman. We have Prince and Kate and Rob Works and his mighty bubbler. We got Trust No One and Vanna White. Yeah, she's a bot. She's a bot. Uh, Vinny Tio. I, I, I don't know what that means. Vinny, Vinicio? Vinny, uh, whatever. We got the Weather Dork bot. He'll tell you the weather any time of day. He'll also do Google searches for you if you prefer to search on the Google. We got the Phantom in CC66. Joskira. Circle line. Circle. She's probably asleep. Wake up, Circle. Um, <laughs> the Cyborg Noodle. Uh, half body, half bot there, the Cyborg Noodle. Uh, we, we got the damn Van Meter. Damn Van Meter, what the hell are you doing? We got duh. And e- E-Man. That's a new name for me. E-Man. All right. Uh, we got Ensive and Frumpy and Gromit. And uh, JJ's over there in Scotland, and Kiss, Matt WJ, Mr. Snick, Ponder Gander, another version of Vinny there, uh, the Pwn Sauce, and uh, the real, real Donny Wu. Uh, we got Sock Puppet himself, yes indeed, the smart ass, the holiest of Holy Rogers, with the Trap Lord, which uh, seems to be a new guy. I still think somehow that's Mike. In disguise. I'm not positive there. But, it, you know, whatever. And we have Zipix. 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 <laughs> Hansel doesn't seem to be tuned in yet. But, you know, he's he's a little slow on the uptake, that Hansel. I don't know why. He just is a little slow on the uptake. <laughs> and we like beating him over the head for exactly that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You never know. You never know. Um, anyway, I got all these stories lined up, and, 
We're going to start off in one of my favorite spots. Climate change. Oh, the mighty, dirty-ass climate change. Yeah, we're all going to die uh, in a short, short while. Yeah, we're all going to die in the next 12 years or the next 10 years or 8 years. I don't know. It's been going on for a long time, and it's been uh, 7, 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 years for a long time. And it's been well over 20 years since the first initial 20 years we're going to die kind of thing. And there would be no more snow, and all the ice caps would be melted, and all the coastal cities would be flooded and gone. None of it's happened. None of it's happened. And you know what? It's probably not going to. <laughs> all right, anyway, we're going to start off on a website known as uh, cnsnews.com here. This is posted on August 27th, 2019, by a guy named Michael Chapman. And he says, or they say, over there, U.S. Navy shut down climate change task force. Huh. Huh. Yes, the U.S. Navy shut down its task force, climate change, TFCC, task force climate change. Yeah, yeah. A little backwards there. Well, which was established by the Obama in 2009. The closure was quiet and occurred in March, according to Greenwire, and the group's tab on uh, on the Navy's Energy, Environment, and Climate Change website was removed sometime between March and July. The purpose of the TFCC was to evaluate how climate change affects or could affect naval and national security operations. Retired near Navy Rear Admiral John White, who ran the TFCC under Obama from 2012 through 2015, said the shutdown was um, suspicious. <laughs> it was a very quiet canceling of the task force, he told E&E &E News. I didn't know about it. No one told me. Usually when you stand down a task force, you want to be able to go in there and declare victory. Yeah, well, how do you declare victory over something that's um, natural and normal, such as climate change? I don't really know that you can declare victory over Mother Earth. It all goes back to the White House, said the Rear Admiral. That's what changed. The White House. Alice Hill, a member of the National Security Council in the Obama administration, indicated the closure of the TFCC has a lot to do with a pattern of climate change denial in President Trump's administration, reported Greenwire. Really? Climate change denial? I don't think he de denies that the climate changes. I'm pretty sure he admits freely that the climate changes. It's just not being caused by you or I. It's consistent with patterns we've seen. Efforts with the title climate change have either been suspended or renamed, said Hill. By not mentioning climate change, we are signaling the events that we're experiencing now. The impacts are not something that immediately needs to be attended to and planned for. How do you plan for what the earth is doing in relation to the sun? Or what the sun is doing in relation to the earth? How do you attend to the sun? I don't get it. <laughs> Across all of the Defense Department, it's hard for me to see that the climate change is taken seriously as it should be. What are you going to do? Rear Admiral, uh, Rear Admiral White told Greenwire, the, the, the task force ended in my opinion, without full incorporation of climate change considerations. And then they got a picture here of AOC holding up her Green New Deal sign. <laughs> and it says here, CNS Newsreader, the liberal media are terrified of the truth, especially when it leads to uncomfortable questions, inconvenient questions, 
about their own leftist worldview. CNS News covers the stories that the liberal media are afraid to touch. It drives the national debate through real, honest journalism, not by misrepresenting or ignoring the facts. CNS News relies on the support of you, their loyal readers. Anyway, it goes on asking for donations and all that kind of happy horseshit. But let me just say this, and, I, and I've said this before on multiple occasions, but how is climate change... <laughs> Uh, how is climate change a partisan thing? How is it a leftist versus rightist concept? It's not something that's, that humans are causing. So, uh, and it, even if it were, do, do, do people on the left, quote, left, not use products that contain oil? Of course they do. Of course they do. So they can jump up and down and complain about it all they want, but they're not actually doing anything to, to, to stop what they are blaming the climate change upon. <laughs> mm. This next article from Woodman's favorite newspaper, the Seattle Times. Climate change is killing our patients. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it says here that the iconic photo that defines climate change has changed from a polar bear on a shrinking ice floe to a child wheezing for breath in a hospital emergency room. Oh. The poor child is wheezing for breath in the hospital emergency room. Oh, uh, by the way, this is a fairly old article. This is December 7th of last year. Um, <laughs> so. A recent report from the Lancet, the world's most widely read medical journal, along with recent October reports from U.S. Climate Assessment and the IPCC, the fake Michael Mann-made hockey stick people, all confirm what we and other physicians are seeing in Washington and beyond. Climate change is harming and killing our patients today. Do you know anybody? Have you ever heard of anybody so far? Of all of the seven plus billion people on this planet, living folks on this planet, that have died because of climate change? Has that been something? No. <laughs> no. No, climate change is not harming or killing anybody. Sorry, guys. Let me go on with this propaganda piece, though. The numbers are striking. The Lancelot's global research team reports that 157 million more vulnerable people experience heat waves yeah, they never experienced heat waves in history, have they? And attendant health risks in 2017, then in 2000. Pollution from particulate matter, a... Okay, that's pollution, that's not climate change. Uh, a key component of wildfire smoke and vehicle exhaust contributed to 2.9 million premature deaths in 2015 alone. Seriously? <laughs> Wildfire smoke and vehicle exhaust contributed to 2.9 million premature deaths in 2015. Come on! <laughs> Vector-borne disease, food shortages, and mental health impacts are becoming a more prevalent and will continue to do so. Maybe you guys never heard of the Dust Bowl if you want to go to uh, food shortages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, anyway, and yeah, that I think was kind of pre-climate change uh, excitement. The findings also confirm that people who did the least to create the problem, which would be everybody, nobody created the problem, 
are disproportionately affected by the consequences. So everybody is disproportionately affected because nobody created the, quote, problem, unquote, that problem that doesn't exist. The impacts are being felt in our region. Between 1990 and 2010, the U.S. climate assessment found that King County saw a 2% increase in heat-related hospitalizations you know, I, I think that's going to come down to more of the uh, the feminization of the of the population uh, than it is to heat relation, <laughs> because <laughs> eh, take that for what it's worth. I I don't know, but it seems to me uh, people are getting, becoming weaker rather than staying at the, their present strength. They're getting stronger. So I don't think it's a, a, a heat-related situation going on there, guys. You may want to look at it that way. but uh... And a 10% increase in deaths on extreme heat days. Uh-huh. Well, there's no, there's no, they, have, they have no links here to any actual data or actual data listed here either, other than them just spewing out numbers. Of this many more people are dying, and it's all due to you driving around in your SUV. You evil humans. Our emergency room colleagues recount devastating, devastating stories of children coughing and wheezing due to worsening asthma during the smoke pollution of this summer's wildfires. Hmm... Uh, and, uh, and it says, and data support that experience, although there's no data here. The U.S. Climate Assessment reports that smoke events from 2004 through 2009 were associated with a 7.2% increase in respiratory admissions for adults over 65 in the eastern, the eastern northwest. Okay. <laughs> In Boise, seven of the past ten years have included at least one week during fire season when air was classified as unhealthy for sensitive groups. Now, of course, declaring air unhealthy for sensitive or not-so-sensitive groups, including those children, can be modified to meet your agenda. If you want to say suddenly that your your unhealthy conditions, unhealthy, uh, unsafe conditions for breathing are at this level now rather than that level without reporting that you changed the level, but just saying that we're having more unhealthy days, well, that works really nice for you all now, doesn't it? As we have all seen, Western Washington has also experienced fire and smoke-related health issues in the past couple of years, as they have for the last few centuries, as long as we've been monitoring them. Yes, yes, they've always had fire and smoke going on in an area covered in forests, especially now that you don't let people manage the forests any longer. <laughs> the good news, the Lancelot confirms that climate change is also the biggest health opportunity of this century. Oh, really? Emerging research on co-benefits, actions that both reduce climate change. How do you reduce climate? You can't reduce climate change. And promote health. Finds that renewable energy, cleaner transportation, and smarter urban design can promote benefits of physical activity, clean our air, and improve mental health. Uh, you guys, uh, I think, need to improve your mental health. This is the kind of stuff you're reporting on here. All right, well, the article goes on talking about more of this specific nonsense. Uh, the Seattle Times is known for being an extremely lefty organization, I guess, I would say. Uh, it's, it's absolute nonsense. Every Every word in this entire article is just absolute propagandic nonsense. And uh, I, 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 I don't know how they get away with printing this kind of stuff. And, and of course, um, 
there's, like I said, no supporting data whatsoever uh, to, to say that this is what happened there and that's what caused this and climate change never happened. Climate change never happened until until SUVs were created. <laughs> oh, but from a least a, a less likely source, a less likely source. Sorry, I needed some water there. Because um, <laughs> the climate change is making my throat dry. Um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> From a less likely source, I'll post it up on dcdirtylaundry.com on September 1st. NASA. NASA. Wow. You would never expect this to come from NASA, but it has. NASA admits that climate change occurs because of changes in Earth's solar orbit and not because of you driving around in your H2 Hummer and fossil fuels. Which, again, uh, the, the term fossil fuels has never been a term I've agreed with because I don't think they're, that you're uh, driving around on dinosaur juice. I'm pretty darn sure you're not driving around on dinosaur juice. Because, well, if you were, think of the billions of gallons of oil that have been pumped out of the earth. And how many dinosaurs it would have taken to create all that fuel. And all of the billions of gallons that are still down there. It's not fossil fuels. Not, not as they define it anyway. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's a whole different topic that we're not going to get into here. <laughs> Hang on one second, dear. All right. So NASA admits, admits freely and openly that climate change is because of changes in the Earth's solar orbit. For more than 60 years, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, has known that the changes occurring to the planetary weathered patterns are completely natural and normal. But the space agency, for whatever reason, has chosen to let the man-made global warming hoax persist and spread to the detriment of human freedom. It was in the year 1958, to be precise, when NASA first observed that the changes in the solar orbit of the Earth, along with alterations to the Earth's axial tilt, are both responsible for what climate scientists today have dubbed as warming, or, or cooling, depending on the agenda of the day, in no way, shape, or form are humans warming or cooling the planet by driving SUVs or eating beef. NASA has thus far failed to set the record straight and has instead chosen to sit silently back and watch as liberals freak out about the world supposedly ending in 12 years. Because of uh, too many cows farting and too many plastic straws and things such as that. In the year 2000, NASA did publish information on its Earth Observatory website about the Milankovitch climate theory, revealing that the planet is, in fact, changing due to extraneous factors that have absolutely nothing to do with human activity. But again, this information has yet to go mainstream some 19 years later which is why deranged, climate-obsessed leftists, and again, leftists, why, why them, uh, have now begun to claim that we really only have 18 months left. So, you know, the middle of 2021, or early 2021, I guess, left before the planet dies from an excess of carbon dioxide. Nonsense. The truth, however, is much more along the lines of what Serbian astrophysicist uh, Milutin, 
Malutin Malinkovich, after whom the Malinkovich climate theory is named, proposed about the seasonal and latitudinal variations of solar radiation that hit the Earth in different ways and at different times have the greatest impact on Earth's claiming, ch changing, cl claiming, changing climate patterns. They got a couple images here that help illustrate this, with the first showing Earth at nearly zero drift, and the second showing the Earth at 0 0.07 orbit. This orbital change is depicted by the eccentric oval shape in the second image, which has been intentionally exaggerated for purpose of showing the massive change in distance that occurs between Earth and the Sun, depending on whether it's at perihelion or aphelion. Aphelion. Even the maximum eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, 0 0.07, it would be impossible to show at the resolution of a web page. Uh, and I, I don't know why this is in here, but it says, Notes to Hal Turner Radio Show. Now, referencing that really kind of discredits everything you said, <laughs> just because uh, we all know about Hal Turner, <laughs> and he is not somebody you want to uh, hitch your wagon to, as it were. Even so, at the current eccentricity of 0 0.17, the Earth's 5 million kilometers closer to the sun at perihelion uh, than at aphelion. For more related news about climate change and global warming from the independent, non-establishment perspective, be sure to check out climatesciencenews.com. Yes, the biggest factor affecting your planet is that big yellow thing in the sky every day. As for Earth's ob obliquity or its change in axial tilt, uh, these two images below, Robert Simon NASA, shows uh, the degree to which the Earth can shift on both axes and its rotational orientation. At higher tilts, Earth's, Earth's seasons become more, much more extreme, while at lower tilts they become much more mild. A similar situation exists for Earth's rotational axis, which, depending on which hemisphere is pointed at the sun during perihelion, it can greatly impact the seasonal extremes between the two hemispheres. And it comes down to, I don't know, 24 degrees or so, which is a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good frickin' tilt. Uh, based on the different variables, Milankovic was able to come up with a comprehensive mathematical model that is able to compute surface temperatures on Earth going way back in time, and the conclusion is simple. Earth's climate has always been changing and is in a constant state of flux due to no fault of our own as human beings. For those of you on the more dense end of things, let me share that with you once again. Earth's climate has always been changing and is in a constant state of flux due to no fault of our own as human beings. Got it? <laughs> when, Mil when Milankovic first put it forward his bottle, it went ignored for nearly half a century. Then, in 1976, a study published in the journal Science confirmed that Milankovic's theory is, in fact, accurate and does correspond to various periods of climate change that have occurred throughout history. In 1982, six years after the study was published, the National Research Council of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences adopted Milankovic's theory as truth, declaring that orb orbital variations remain the most thoroughly examined mechanism of climactic change on timescales of tens of thousands of years and are by far the clearest case of direct effect on changing insulation on the lower atmosphere of the Earth. <laughs> yes, state of flux. State of flux. <laughs> if we had to, if we had to sum the whole thing up in one simple phrase, it would be this: 
The biggest factor influencing weather and climate patterns on Earth is the sun. Period. Depending on the position of the sun at any given time, climate conditions are going to vary dramatically and even create drastic abnormalities that defy everything that the humans thought they knew about how the Earth worked. But rather than embrace this truth, Today's climate, quote, scientists, unquote, joined by the leftist politicians and the complicit mainstream media, insist that it is not using reusable grocery bags at the supermarket and not having an electric vehicle are destroying the planet so quickly, destroying the planet so quickly that we absolutely must implement global climate taxes as the solution because as you know the sun loves it when some group of people taxes another group of people the sun gets off on taxes <laughs> the climate change debate is not about science it is an effort to impose political and economic controls on the population by the elite wrote one commenter uh, and it's another way to divide the population against itself with some who believe in man-made global warming and some who don't. So, uh, you know, you, you can take that whole article for what it's worth. However, uh, they do have links here to to the NASA reports um, and some stuff on some other websites as well. Um, not just that Hal Turner nonsense. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why anybody's referencing anything that Hal Turner's got to say, but yeah, you know, um, they do. So, uh, <laughs> maybe they don't know about Hal. I don't know, but, uh, let, let me just tell you this. If you're not familiar with who Hal Turner is, avoid his ass. Avoid his ass like it's the plague, because, uh, if it's, it, it probably is the plague, and you'll probably get sick and die from it. Ah, but what do you think about climate change? What are your personal thoughts on climate change? How are you feeling about Greta and Al Gore and Michael Mann and the rest of that crowd? Well, whether you know it or not, they will know it. They will know it. <laughs> From the independent.co.uk, posted on August 28th. Tech giants want to read our thoughts, and the implications are frightening. Straight out of a science fiction novel, our future might be as cyborgs, and those who, who don't adapt will lose out. Not content with monitoring almost everything you do online, Facebook now wants to read your mind as well. The social media giant recently announced a breakthrough in its plan to create a device that reads people's brain waves to allow them to type just by thinking. And Elon Musk wants to go even further. One of the Tesla boss's other companies, Neuralink, is developing a brain implant to connect people's minds directly to your computer. Musk admits that he takes inspiration from science fiction and that he wants to make sure that humans can keep up with artificial intelligence. He seems to have the missed the part of the sci-fi that acts as a warning <laughs> for the imp implications of technology. Yeah, 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 Ma uh, Elon... Um, 1984 was not meant as an instruction manual. <laughs> oh, these mind reading systems could affect our pri could uh, would affect our privacy, security, identity, equality and personal safety. Do we really want all that left to companies with philosophies such as that of Facebook and their former mantra, move fast and break things? That's their, that was their mantra? I never heard that before. All right. Move fast and break things. Okay. 
That's a great one. Though they sound futuristic, the technologies needed to make brainwave reading devices are not that dissimilar to the standard MRI and EEG neuroscience tools used in hospitals. You can already buy a kit to control a drone with your mind, so using one to type out words in some ways is not that much of a leap. The advance will likely be due uh, to the use of machine learning and sift through huge quantities of data collected from our brains and find the patterns in neuron activity that link thoughts to specific words. A brain implant is likely to take maybe a little longer to develop, and it's important to separate out the actual achievements of Neuralink from media hype and promotion. But Neuralink has made simultaneous improvements in materials for electrodes and robot-assisted surgery to implant them. Uh, packaging the technology neatly so it can be read via USB. So you'll just have a, a USB port in your head and you, you'll just <laughs> plug, right, plug right in. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know that a USB uh, port, e even the, the fastest USB port, is got to be fast enough to, to read your brain data. But maybe they're only going to read a little bit of it. I, I don't know. Facebook and Neuralink's plans may build on established medical practice, but when companies are collecting thoughts directly from our brains, eh, the ethical issues kind of change. Any system that could collect data directly from your brains has clear privacy risks. Privacy is about consent, but it's very difficult to give proper consent if someone is tapping directly into your thoughts. Silicon Valley companies and governments already surreptitiously gather as much data on us as they can and use it in ways they oughtn't. How sure can we be that our random and personal thoughts won't be captured and studied alongside the instructions uh, we want to give the technology? Uh, well, you, not only can you not be sure that they won't be, but you can be sure that they will be. Of the existing ethical issues with data gathering and is discrimination based on attributes such as gender or race that can be discerned from the data. Providing a window into people's minds could make it easier to determine other things that might, from the basis of prejudice, such as sexuality or political ideology, or even different ways of thinking that might include things like autism. With a system that taps directly into your brain, not only could your thoughts be stolen, but it's also possible they could be manipulated as well. Brain stimulation is already being developed to help treat PTSD as a and reduce violence. By the way, I have another article for a later time uh, about how artificial memories have already been created and implanted into, I, I think it was mice or rats or whatever, but but they've done it. They, they've done it. They can do it. They'll continue doing it. There are even sensational claims that can be used uh, to upload knowledge directly, just like into the film, uh, The Matrix. <laughs> As Hal often says, The Matrix is not a movie. The Matrix is not a movie. <laughs> So yeah, um, you, you don't want you don't want these guys tapping directly into your brain. That's all I know, and I, I don't care how wonderful or fun it sounds, uh, because it does sound kind of like fun to be able to do some of that stuff automatically, uh, uh, just thinking about stuff or whatever. But uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> No, you don't want any of that. <laughs> All right, next, from techdirt.com, posted August 30th here by Glenn Moody, from the uh, sorry about that department. <laughs> Whoops, our bad. Not really their bad. I, I think it was all intentional, but here you go. You know that mobile phone tracking data you you use as, as evidence in over 10,000 court cases? Turns out, well, 
it was wrong. Some of it was wrong. A lot of it was wrong. But we're not sure which which, which part was wrong yet. <laughs> As many people have pointed out, our mobile phones are the perfect surveillance device. Most people carry them around voluntarily while they are awake. Put this together with the fact that mobile phones have to connect to a nearby transmitter in order to work, and you end up with a pretty good, pretty good idea of where that person using that particular device is all throughout the day. No surprise, then, that police and prosecutors around the world turn routinely to phone tracking data when they are investigating cases. But as the New York Times reports, there can be serious problems with simply assuming the results are reliable. The Danish authorities have to review over 10,000 court verdicts because of errors in mobile phone tracking data that was offered as evidence in those cases. In addition, Denmark's Director of Public Prosecutions has ordered a two-month halt on the use of this location data in criminal cases, while experts try and sort out the problems. The first error found was an IT system that converts phone companies' raw data into evidence that police and prosecutors can use to place you at the scene of a crime. During the conversions, the system omitted some data, creating a less detailed image of the cell phone's whereabouts. The error was fixed in March, so they say, after, a na after the national police discovered it. In a second problem, some cell phone tracking data linked phones to the wrong cell phone tower, potentially connecting innocent people to crime scenes. It's not clear yet how serious the blunders will turn out to be. It might only be a few, maybe relatively minor cases, or it might involve a large number of more serious crimes. Either way, it's a salutary reminder that however useful technology might appear for the purposes of solving crimes, and however straightforward its application seems, things can and will go wrong, and it will also be used wrong intentionally in many cases when they want to get you for something. There's another approach that some people tend to view as infallible, the use of DNA sequencing technique to identify suspects from material left at the scene of the crime. DNA is undoubtedly a powerful way of pulling information from tiny amounts of material. But, and this is a big but, <laughs> it's a Bertha sized but, there are a number of ways in which it can be, uh, it can mislead badly. The same applies to mobile phone location data as the Danish experience uh, usefully underlines. So, um, they, they put all this crap out there and, and they don't even look for exact matches as far as like DNA or fingerprints go. Uh, they get like a certain amount of points match. They say that's close enough to say this, this is, you know, perfect data when it's absolutely not. So what if you're just walking down the road, and, and you know, as you walk down the road these days, they got them uh, security cameras everywhere, taking pictures of who's there walking by, or who's at a, at, a, at a counter pointing a gun at a clerk saying, give me all your money. Posted on Reuters.com here on September 2nd, 2019 by Josh Horowitz. Chinese face swapping app goes viral. <laughs> Sparks privacy concerns. Yeah, privacy is not the only concern. Uh, a new Chinese app that lets users swap their faces with celebrity sports stars or anyone else in a video clip racked up millions of downloads on the weekend, but swiftly drew fire over privacy issues. The app's surge in popularity and sudden backlash from some users highlights how artificial intelligence technologies 
bring about the new concerns surrounding identity verifications. Zhao was uploaded to the Chinese iOS App Store on Friday and immediately went viral, according to a post from the app makers on China's Twitter-like Weibo. Uh, Zhao's servers nearly crashed due to the surge in traffic. According to the app Annie, a firm that tracks app downloads all over the world, Zhao was the most downloaded free app in China's iOS App Store as of September 1st. Consumers sign up for Zhao with their phone numbers and upload images of their face using photographs taken with their smartphone. They can then choose from a range of videos of celebrities to superimpose their face and share videos with their friends. In addition to Chinese celebrities, you could look like De- uh, Leonard Art- Le- Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio or Marilyn Monroe. Okay, I, I don't care about any of that. You want to look like a celebrity, have fun time making a video, put your head on, 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 on Arnold Schwarzenegger's body. I don't know what the hell you want to do. My concern is the opposite. That somebody takes your face, puts it on that of somebody doing something that you, they shouldn't ought to be doing and uses that as evidence against you to do bad things to you. That would be my concern. <laughs> uh, Weibo, W-E-I-B-O, I believe. All right, all right. Do you trust the government? Do you think the government is telling you the truth about, well, anything? Do you think, do you believe that there are unidentified flying objects visiting this planet from time to time? Do you think the government's telling you the truth about those, if Indeed, you do believe that they are. I'm pretty positive they are. I, I, matter of fact, am positive that they are. However, you, maybe like me, and most of the Americans who say, the government is lying, lying, <laughs> on UPI.com, September 9th. The existence of extra, extraterrestrial flying objects is one of the longest enduring conspiracy theories in history. And a new survey shows that almost two-thirds of you Americans believe that the federal government knows more than it's saying on the matter. Gallup said researchers discovered 68%. Now, wait a minute. The previous, the previous line said almost two-thirds. This says 68%, which is more than two-thirds, just slightly, but it's still, it's more than two-thirds. <laughs> anyway, Gallup said researchers discovered 68% of respondents answered yes when asked whether the U.S. government knows more about UFOs than it's telling us. 29% said no, of those who answered uh, yes, about half also said they believe the government is hiding information about alien space landings. 33% said they believe an alien spacecraft has visited the Earth at some point. The survey results continue to decades-long trend of distrust among you and I, Americans, for their government on the subject of intelligent life and pretty much every other subject. (laughs) Intelligent alien life. (laughs) I I would say intelligent life, but, you know, that's a whole different ballgame to get into there. That does include humans. uh, And intelligent life among humans is more rare than you've been led to believe. Gallup's 1996 survey on the issue showed 71% didn't trust the government on the issue. Perhaps no other event has been linked to a government involvement than the crash in Roswell, New Mexico in July of 1947. 
a number of witnesses claim to have seen the wreckage of the alien spacecraft there and the United States military hauling away debris. The government has long denied the claims, saying at the time of the wreckage, well, not at the time of the wreckage, but the day after the time of the wreckage, that it was a downed weather balloon. At first, they said, it was a UFO. The next day, they said, oh, no, 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 we didn't mean a UFO, we meant a weather balloon. Really? <laughs> As for UFO sightings, Gallup found 60% were skeptical, saying they could be explained by human activity or natural phenomena. Only 16% said they have personally witnessed something they thought was a UFO. I've, I've seen one. I've seen actually several, but um, yeah. Anyway, while the majority, 84%, have not, 33% said at least some of the UFO sightings throughout history were actual alien spacecraft. Regardless of what you think of UFOs or the government's awareness of them, the subject is part of the nation's consciousness, with 86% of U.S. adults saying they have heard of or read about unidentified flying objects. Who has not heard of a UFO or read about a UFO? Come on. There's 14% of the people out there that have never heard of a UFO? <laughs> Somebody's lying somewhere, man, let me tell you. <laughs> now, this next story, I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis. Uh, this happened in New Mexico, up up around the Taos area, which is north, northern New Mexico. And, and uh, this article, when was this article posted? September 6th. Now, I heard these guys, I think it was on the local radio station, might have also been on Coast to Coast AM. But it's a very interesting story. These two guys, these two hunters, bow hunters, they were up there in the mountains trying to track down some deer. But they weren't finding any deer. And and and, and so they hiked up on this one thing, and this guy saw this other guy standing up on this further hill because they, they weren't really seeing anything going on, and he was going to go up and ask this other hunter, if he'd seen any deer out there, it was strange. There was no deer in this area at that time of, of the year. But as he approached it, it looked like maybe it really wasn't quite a man. It was something different about him. So he had to go down this little gully and back up to get to the top of the hill where the guy was standing at. And when he got up there, there was the guy was gone. There was no sign of him. He was missing. Anyway, the next day, they, he goes uh, with his buddy there. Um, and, and marching over a couple of more hills to, to, to where the guy was at and look around. And they saw this thing, and they thought, what the hell is that, like a like maybe a big tent? They thought maybe there was so They make a lot of movies here in New Mexico. It's kind of like the, a, a new Hollywood situation going on in New Mexico. Anyway, so they, they saw this big thing. It looked like a big, big tent out there, maybe for actors or doing staging or whatever. And they were going, all right, well, let's go check this out, see what's going on over there. But as they started walking towards this thing, the whole thing lifted up and flew away. <laughs> and it was huge. It was apparently huge. <laughs> and and it didn't just, like, fly away. It, it came up off the ground, and then, poof, it was gone. Uh, I'll, I'm going to let you guys read the article for yourself. But it's very interesting. Uh, I, the, the, the hunters' names are Josh Brinkley and Daniel Lacerno, Lacero. Um, so... Uh, you might want to check it out. There's probably more newer information than this here. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they, there was no no animals up there and uh, for them to hunt for whatever reason. They weren't around. Strange-looking creatures standing up on, on, on top of hills. Um, big old production tents flying away like magic into the sky. I believe the guys. I believe they saw what they saw. These guys are not UFO guys. They don't believe in UFOs. At least they didn't. <laughs> At least they say they didn't anyway. So, uh, yeah, check that out. It's uh, uh, quite the interesting story. And I think you'll get more out of reading it to yourself uh, than, uh, than than you will for me. That's on TaosNews.com. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, next story. 
Something you all know about, or at least you should know about. Maybe all you don't realize it, but it's here and it's true. I've been bitching about this for a long time, but, uh, yeah, whatever. Doesn't matter. Posted September 9th on AIER.org, the American Institute for Economic Research, by Richard Ebeling. The Secret History of the Monopolization of Welfare by the State. I don't know if you've noticed or not, and I don't know how old you are. But back when I was a child, there were charity organizations that were just plain good old charity organizations. They didn't rely on government handouts. They weren't uh, 501c3s or whatever the hell they call them now. They weren't all given money and then regulated by government entities. They all now are. You can't really be a charity more or less, without that designation and that, without that government control. The fundamental political issue can always confronting society is whether human relationships should be based on free association and voluntary choice or on governmental compulsion and command. Of course, in most societies, there are elements of both often called interventionist state or the mixed economy. But nonetheless, the basic institutional alternatives are, uh, are liberty or coercion. This often seems difficult for people to fully appreciate or understand. We select where we live. We accept or not accept a job offer. Uh, we decide on the furniture in our home and what, if anything, we will read in terms of books or magazines or watch on the television. We pick our friends and choose the clubs and associations that we want to join. A thousand of other everyday choices and decisions reflect our freedom and still much of what we do. Yet, at the same time, we take for granted many aspects and facets of our lives where such decision-making is narrowed or co-opted for us by those in political authority. We are compelled to pay into government pension systems called Social Security. We are taxed to pay for types and degrees of, uh, and degrees of medical and health care that we may or may not desire or consider worth what the government garnishes from our salaries to pay for it before we even see a penny of our earned incomes. The government regulates how business is done, under what terms and conditions an employer may hire a worker, what pro products may be produced, and what qualities, features, or characteristics, and sometimes the actual price at which the good or service may be sold. These two are taken for granted and presumed to be appropriate and necessary tasks of government in a modern society. Indeed, in many, if not most instances, the majority of Americans and the citizens of other countries as well don't or rarely think twice about these roles for the political authority in our daily affairs. In fact, when they are challenged, a good number of people are shocked that it should even be questioned. What? I'm allowed to ask questions about stuff? <laughs> Yet all these government activities inescapably reduce and restrict our free choices. Think of medical and health care. Increasingly, government prevents people from deciding on the health insurance and medical treatment they may receive or purchase on their own. Practically all of the candidates vying for the Democratic Party presidential nomination have said they want to see implemented some form of single some form of single payer system, which, in reality, is socialized medicine under which government centrally plans all medical matters for everyone in society. When friends or freedom raise serious questions about this, including government being handed control over life and death decisions for us all, uh, in terms of the type and duration of medical treatment 
They are often scoffed at. Yet this danger has been warned about for more than a century. In 1916, in the midst of the First World War, a fairly well-known British lawyer and classical liberal, which is a good thing, classical liberal, basically a libertarian, E.S.P. Haynes published a book called The Decline of Liberty in England. He explained how the British government had been encroaching on people's personal, social, and economic freedom in Great Britain for nearly 40 years, and the wartime emergency had merely exacerbated this trend. He wondered how much of this could or might be reversed when the war was over. All right, this is a, a long article, and I'm out of time. But let me tell you right now that if you don't understand that uh, that welfare has been absolutely, totally monopolized by the state, then, then, then you're missing out. And definitely read this article. Read this article. Share this article with other people. Try and make them understand what's going on and why this is a massive loss of freedom. Freedom. Some form. <laughs> All right, Frumpy. All right, I'm going to close with this here. Uh, I know I'm out of, over my time already, but Sock Puppet asked me earlier, about this, and I already had this loaded up for my uh, for my show, so I'll go ahead and just give you the uh, quick bullet points here. Five steps to winterize your vegetable garden. This was posted back in April, and I think Sock actually might have given me this this article. I don't know, uh, but basically it's clean up, you know, prepare for the hibernation uh, by cleaning it up. Test the soil uh, now that the garden's empty, which yes, I do need to do some pH testing out there. Reflect and plan. Uh, it's time to put a is it time to put your feet up and make time for reflection? Eh, uh, yeah, you have to think about what ha what worked and what didn't work. Protect your soil, aside from a crop cover. Also, pre prepare your garden for winter by protecting the soil. My soil is pretty much terrible, so I'm not going to really protect much. Uh, and I, but I'll probably protect the compost heap uh, and a reflect and plan. Da 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 da. So there you go, five steps, uh, and uh, you can read all the details of those steps here in the article on livingthenourishedlife.com website. Uh, so thank you all so much for tuning in. Hopefully got something out of the show and or enjoyed the show anyway. Got a laugh, a chuckle, uh, maybe learned something new. I don't know, whatever. It's cool. <laughs> I'll be back next week with episode 42 uh, of The Grim Leftovers. Check the schedule on reallibertymedia.com for the shows throughout the week, and it's possible we'll have some uh, pop-up shows coming along. I know Vinny said he was thinking about doing a reading of some sort, Chapter 2 of his deal that he's working on, uh, and maybe something else, who knows? Anti came in last week. Could be anybody else popping in that wants to do a show. So check that out. Um, have a great week, really. Talk to you all later. Peace.